Um, well, every well, thanks everybody. Um, good morning and or good afternoon, depending on where you're located. Um, welcome to the second day of the virtual workshop on clean, responsible, and sustainable natural gas in Africa. Um, my name is Rachel Halpern, and I am the director of the Division of Justice and Engagement in our Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management. Um, so you heard you heard from my Deputy Assistant Secretary Ryan P yesterday. Um, he he and um, I should note that um, our we, we've we've changed we've changed our name since this agenda was, was written. Um, so I am now in Ryan's office, which is the Office of Resource Sustainability, and my division is called Justice and Engagement. So my division supports DOE's outreach with government agencies, foreign government, and non-government entities, academia, the public, and more. Um, on issues related to minimizing and preventing impacts from the development and utilization of fossil fuels. And with our new mission, we also focus and uh, promote engagement um, with, with communities around environmental and energy justice issues, which is a big priority for the administration. I'd like to start by thanking the speakers and moderators who participated in yesterday's session, and I look forward to hearing what today's speakers have to say. Yesterday, we heard about tangible approaches and solutions that the US government is supporting to address the climate emergency and reach a net zero carbon energy economy. We also heard um, really, really insightful perspectives from our guest speakers on the goals for, for folks, folks in Africa for securing access to sustainable, responsible, and modern energy to grow their economies and also to be a global partner to help address climate change. And these were all very valuable perspectives. So to wrap up this introduction, I'm looking forward to today's more in-depth discussion on some of the topics that we talked about yesterday. And those topics include methane reduction efforts for natural gas systems um, by, by deploying efforts to quantify and mitigate methane emissions. Um, how we how we can develop new markets for value added products derived from stranded gas and how we can decarbonize the power and other industrial sectors with um, carbon capture and storage technologies. And these are all going to play an important role in securing energy access and jobs while facilitating transition for for all our, for all our countries to clean energy economies. So with that, I will now introduce the moderator for our first session today. That will be Stephen Thompson, who is a global head for Potent and Partners um, LNG and Natural Gas Advisors. Um, Stephen, I hand it over to you. Um, unless um, our unless our NETL hosts need to give any any uh, any technical tips or anything like that for the for the webinar. Nope, we're good to move forward here. Thanks. All right. Well, Stephen, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel. And it's a pleasure to be able to moderate this panel. Uh, the, uh, the topic is, is vast, uh, fostering technology innovation to maximize abatement of emissions in the natural gas sector. Uh, I think you could go on for several days just on, on that topic, but uh, we only have about 45 minutes, so it's a short period of time and we'll, we'll try to get in as much as we, we can both through the presentations and then uh, the uh, the Q&A uh, following that. Um, we have three uh, really good uh, uh, speakers to sort of focus the discussion and provide just uh, a grist for the, um, uh, for the Q&A. Uh, the first of those speakers is uh, Jared Seferno. Let me uh, tell a bit about him. He's the technology manager of the National Energy Technology Laboratories Upstream and Midstream Natural Gas and oil R&D programs, and that means he manages an R&D portfolio with projects that go from basic energy science uh, through to large-scale field uh, demonstrations. It includes upstream natural gas, shale gas, midstream, enhanced oil, methane hydrates. Uh, he's been doing this uh, for about uh, 20 years uh, with diversified engineering and management expertise, and his emphasis has been on uh, emissions control, which indeed will be uh, a focus of his comments today. Uh, previously, uh, he served as director of the Office of Coal and Power R&D Programs, technology manager of the Carbon Capture Program, and engineering systems analyst. 
So with that introduction, uh, Jared, over to you, please. And uh, uh, looking forward to hearing your comments. Great, thank you, Stephen. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, let me, yeah, I, if you can't hear me, you can um, get my slides up. Yes, well, we good can morning. Um, Okay, great. Thank you for the introduction, Stephen. So over the next 10 to 12 minutes, I'm just gonna give you a high level overview of one, one rel, um, relevant program area under the fossil energy carbon management. And this program um, is focused on the methane emissions quantification and mitigation programs. And they're really two separate programs. So back in 2016, um, second to CO2 greenhouse gas emissions, methane emissions were number two. And the uh, uh, methane emissions across the natural gas infrastructure. Depending on what reference that you look at, a lot of studies have been done. When you look at the United States, when you look at the emissions profile, roughly between one and a half to say two and a half percent of natural gas is estimated to be emitted into the atmosphere. So across that infrastructure from source to sink, around say 2%, and it really depends on what study you look at. So in 2016, we embarked on really a dual program area, a double program, really focused on detecting the methane emissions, recognizing it's challenging across the complex infrastructure that the United States has today. Uh, the, the natural gas is produced across the U.S. geographically. Um, you have an aged natural gas infrastructure, tens of thousands of miles of pipelines, hundreds of thousands of unit operations. How do you detect those emissions cost effectively? What are the best technologies? And second to that is how do you quantify it? Quantifying those emissions from ground and or from the air, airborne emissions. And then finally, coming up with mitigation technologies. Where are the largest emissions taking place? What are the engineering barriers or is it operational barriers? Is it operational who are the super emitters? Is that on poor operation? Or is it a technology barrier? Um, do technologies not exist to cost effectively prevent? So in 2016, um, the program's roughly annually around 20 million a year combined. We partner with technology development experts, and these experts um, are from academia, technology, independent and technology developers, other national labs. So we have a diverse portfolio and we have the latitude to provide DOE funding and partner with the best of the best technology experts in the region to overcome the solution. So I'm gonna spend just a few minutes to go over what are our program goals, what the motivation behind those goals are, and just give a half a dozen example of some types of projects. Brian, how do I go? If if you um, there, okay. well, there you go. Yeah. So here here's the detail um, at the highest level, and, and really in 2016 we were focused on detecting the methane emissions, recognizing that really quantifying the emissions, looking at a plume, is really a, a grand challenge. Um, say for when you look at a plume, how do you quantify, and measure that flux rate from afar? But um, we're our focus on development of direct and remote measurement sensor technologies for the collection, dissemination, and analysis of emissions data. That's a key goal of enabling better detection technologies, both on the ground and in from the air. And that data, the second bullet there is that really this collected, so we're actually doing two things. We're developing advanced technologies, but plus we're out in the field, I'll show you in a minute. We're actually taking these technologies in the field and actually gathering emissions data from various components, such as compressors, gathering lines, marginal wells. And we provide that data to EPA's greenhouse gas inventory. So it's really twofold, better technology development, but also ground truthing and getting out there into the field. Uh, the third bullet is really it's something new. Um, we recognizing, and it's shown in the figure, there's roughly 500,000 to 700,000, somewhat a large gap, uncertainty of abandoned and orphaned natural gas wells throughout the U.S that are leaking methane emissions and the rates are different. Um, so that's, we're, from a detection standpoint of 
improving our capability of locating these wells, those are only estimates and really de quantifying the amount of emissions. So, so what is the motivation? You've probably heard top down, bottom up. It's estimated the first bullet is really, depending again on the study, it's, it's, we, we feel that the, it's underestimated by the amount of methane, methane emissions that are taking place across the infrastructure. When you look at bottom up estimates, when you look at all the unit operations and you add them up with emission factors, compared to what's being measured in the atmosphere, there's a disconnect there, and that can be roughly 60% or more. Again, it depends on the study. It's, it's hard to really reconcile top down, bottom up. So we know that that's a need. How can we close that gap and improve our understanding exactly what are the emissions factors and where are the highest emissions coming from? The third bullet here shown is really, again, going back to the orphan wells, the number of orphan wells, these abandoned wells that are just passively leaking continuously. How do we kind of detect those and mitigate that? So that's really the motivation, improved the technologies and improving our ability to um, understand the big picture. So just the next three slides are just get examples. Again, we have a portfolio, it's not large, maybe only 12 to 15 projects. And here are three projects to show you examples. One is a smart methane emissions detection system. Um, there are cameras and there's technologies, you know, laser-based technologies that can detect the plume. And that's what's in the upper right in the figure. But what do, what's the DOE trying to do? We're trying to add the, you know, we're trying to make it, remove the, the uh, human in the loop, really to try to make these autonomous, um, autonomous, um, real-time methane leak detection technology. And so we've provided funding to this team down below collaborative funding, and so such that um, these drone-based systems with improved sensor technology can be used to detect emissions across gathering lines, um, production stations, et cetera. So this has been developed over the last four or five years with very, very successful results. Um, the emissions are detected in the air, and then the drone automatically goes out and tries to find the and confirm the emissions location. Lastly, the last two years of the project, is next, the, the challenging part is really quantifying the emissions. You can look at the plume, detect the methane. How do you quantify them? What's the flux rate? So that's a specific technology. So what do you do with, that's one technology, but there's other technologies within DOE as well as outside DOE that are being developed. Detection technologies, there's a, probably a large market for that in the future. Well, how do you standardize um, technology validation? So we have a site, this is in Fort Collins, Colorado, where we have actually a field site where it is representative of various natural gas um, components from tanks and compressors to pipelines. And this site here is to take technologies and develop and uh, test protocols for controlled testing um, for leak detection and quantification. So this is actually a test facility that can validate new technologies, um, gather the data, and develop a testing protocol, kind of best practices. Take that information, and the fourth bullet here is really to show us, really to, such that to enable the state and federal regulatory agencies to adopt new technologies. New technologies are being developed continuously, but there's uncertainty in how do you adopt those technologies to be, um, you know, the, the validated, to be uh, the best in class technology um, to detect emissions. So again, this is a field site that we're testing multiple technologies continuously and gather enough data to try to inform state regulatory, as well as even operators on best available technology solutions. Next example is, I mentioned marginal wells. This is an example beyond technology. We're actually out into the field. So the Department of Energy, um, NETL, we will take our own staff or we'll partner with folks such as GSI Environmental. This is an example where there are um, hundreds of thousands of marginal wells throughout the United States. Um, these are low producing oil and gas wells. Um, when I say low producing, less than 90 MCF of gas and less than 15 barrels of oil per day. But there's multiple, and combined, they do provide um, a fair amount of our resources. 
we held three campaigns to estimate in 2019, 2020, and 2021, and you can see the, see the dots here. But what we did was we set up three campaigns. We went out and estimated emissions from these marginal wells. Why did we do that? Because there's some recommendations on adding more control, emission controls to these wells. And given the level of production, um, it, it may not be cost effective. So what we're trying to do is really ground truth, getting into the field of these different locations and using statistics to try to get a representative estimate from the marginal wells. And you can see this slide, they range from two to 79 years old, um, the equipment, so a, a big a gap there. That's an example, we're actually boots on the ground going out and measuring emissions, even with new technology. And lastly, for quantif and then, so that's really just the examples of technology development. We have the field for validation and we're actually in the field of quantifying emissions. Let me move just real briefly on mitigation. So of developing advanced technologies to mitigate emissions. So um, that's the second part of the program. Um, so it's focused on really developing advanced technologies to mitigate emissions. Um, let me move quickly on, you know, the motivation behind that, this is a little bit of a busy slide. And the lower right-hand side is a table here. When you look at the estimated emissions across the natural gas infrastructure, that they're primarily, primarily emitted from compressor stations, um, from gathering line compressors, and you know, there, there's compressors from source to sink throughout the value chain. And that is the highest emitter that's, um, that's identified compressor stations. Second to compressor stations are pneumatic controllers. Um, so then orphan wells, as I mentioned before. So this program is focused on developing advanced technologies geared towards reducing and mitigating emissions for compressor stations and or orphan wells or pneumatic controllers. And here's an example here. There are multiple old, depending on the location, um, compressor stations for gathering lines, and it's really not cost effective to change out that and the entire compressor system, but how can you retrofit it? So this is one example with Oklahoma University and in industry um, that we are developing a new retrofit technology for intermittent natural gas gathering line compressor stations. Um, and it involves anywhere from advanced data analytics to machine learning to actual tangible technology components that are applied to the engine and compressor system. And the, the, the largest challenge is when you have interruptible flow and you're not at steady state um, use of the compressor station, that's where your largest emissions come from through the exhaust. So how do you control this engine in a non steady state condition to reduce its overall emission. So that's one example we're trying to really tackle, offer solutions that are low cost. Lastly, this is my last slide on methane mitigation. Um, there's repair, you know, pipelines do leak, they have repairs, they have corrosion, that's not new. Um, even when new pipelines are put in, steel pipelines, they're not perfect. You will have um, issues with the pipeline system. So we're developing new coding systems for, um, to apply to pipelines in the field that are cost effective and resilient to future corrosion, primarily around wells. We've, we've identified areas where they're at high risk for um, fugitive emissions, um, leaks from these different weldments, and we're developing, working with these entities here to try to get very cost effective field protective coatings. So that's an example of the types of technologies we're developing for our quantification as well as mitigation. And that ends my presentation to just kind of give you a quick overview. But thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jared. I think that's a, a great introduction and um, it, it covers one part of it, which is really what the state of the art uh, is on the on the uh, detection uh, technology. And, and uh, that's gonna be an important piece of, of the puzzle. Right. Uh, I do think it's a it's a complex uh, puzzle, and I think that that's a good uh, site to our our next uh, speaker, who is uh, Great. thank uh, you, Bio Olare Waju Alo, and he is a principal consultant and partner at Avadon Project and Engineering Services Limited. 
Um, he originally got a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from the University of Ife. He joined Shell Petroleum Company in 1978 uh, as a trainee and uh, retired in 2011 as the general manager of corporate engineering. So he was with Shell for 30 years in Nigeria, the UK, Netherlands, uh, with a huge experience in gas treatment and, and gel extraction in, in uh, gas plants from uh, St. Fergus um, in Scotland uh, on down. Uh, he was uh, involved in um, Get, uh, flare gas monetization projects and was part of a team that developed uh, a fiscal regime uh, by the government to uh, incentivize flare gas projects in Nigeria. And uh, uh, in 2012, he, he joined uh, his, his current firm, uh, Avalon Project Engineering Services, as, as partner and principal consultant. And they provide support and training in facility engineering and project management to the oil and, and gas industry. And I think this as I say, is a really nice uh, setup because it, it sort of segs from emissions to flaring. And I think, uh, you know, that really does uh, help to to cover the space in, in uh, emissions abatement and, and sets up a nice uh, polarity or, or almost tension in, in the speakers today. So I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, uh, your comments, uh, Bayo, and, and please uh, uh, proceed with your presentation. Thank you, uh, Stephen. Um, good morning and good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, depending on where you are in the globe, uh, I would like to talk about how we can maximize abatement of emissions in the, the natural gas sector. And this time, uh, I would like to include refinery and petrochemical plants where gas uh, is processed and where how we can minimize uh, emission. Next slide, please. Bio, you're you're the presenter now. Um, if if you click on the presentation itself, you'll be able to um, hit the top button on the left. There's a little navigation bar, um, oh. and it'll show you the thumbnails. Presentation on the left. You you click on the presentation slide itself, and then you'll have like a little toolbar, and the top toolbar has four little squares on it. You can just click that and it'll show you all the thumbnails and you can click on each thumbnail to go to the next slide. Okay, great. There you go. Right. Um, this graph shows the top 20 gas reserves in the world. I would not like to, to spend time on this. The next one shows Africa. Uh, and the number nine in the top 20 in the world is Nigeria and Nigeria now is the um, has the biggest proven reserves in Africa. Uh, I want to uh, also look at the total gas reserves in Africa compared with what we have uh, globally, and that will take us to the uh, the context of Africa. You know, Africa accounts for less than nine percent of the global world gas reserve. Uh, Africa has huge population, very young uh, demography, where uh, energy uh, supply or utilization per capita is very low, and people are yearning for more energy. And Africa also has problem of uh, infrastructural deficit. Africa needs to grow its GDP, grow the economy and create jobs for the teeming young uh, population. Therefore, Africa needs uh, to monetize its natural gas, albeit in a very responsible way. And in addressing uh, energy transition to cleaner energy, uh, gas is seen as a cleaner uh, fuel than oil although it's still a uh, fossil fuel, but uh, comparatively uh, cleaner than oil and other heavy uh, energy sources. But uh, in developing the uh, gas reserve to uh, uh, create uh, job opportunities and improve the economy and create uh, infrastructure that we badly need, 
data has to be done uh, in a responsible, uh, responsible way and taking into account all the issues of uh, climate change. So, the natural gas will replace the conventional energy sources, uh, firewood, coal, liquid uh, fuel, diesel. Uh, uh, in my country, Nigeria, for example, uh, because um, electricity is so unfortunately uh, unreliable and uh, we don't have enough of it to go around. A lot of people help themselves with uh, diesel uh, generators, and uh, this diesel generator uh, do not do uh, uh, good to the environment. So uh, to meet the energy needs uh, with gas, gas must be developed uh, in a responsible way and also in a sustainable, uh, sustainable way also. What are emissions uh, sources? <clears throat> we have CO2 that comes from uh, gas plants, uh, ga uh, sorry, power plants, uh, from uh, burning of flare gas, generates a lot of CO2. Uh, but what uh, I'm more concerned about talking about uh, today is uh, what we call uh, fugitive uh, emissions. These are emissions of hydrocarbon resulting uh, from loss of containment, leaks, uh, relief valves, or evaporation from uh, uh, open uh, sources where we have uh, where we have hydrocarbon, on or on in, uh, intended release of uh, hydrocarbon vapor. Um, in some places, you have uh, uh, stark cold vents and so forth. So methane is the greatest uh, challenge that um, I believe we face from the context of uh, greenhouse gases and methane, this is because methane is a lot more, uh, uh, about 20, 28 times more warming than CO2. So, uh, so when you look at CO2 and the methane, methane uh, is, is a the more of a problem in uh, raising the global uh, climate temperature. So uh, to manage this emission in the uh, uh, natural gas plants, it's not something that you do uh, once, it's something that has to be done throughout the uh, life cycle of the plant. Uh, methane in particular has to be managed and uh, to a lab. Uh, a lab is um, as low as pra uh, reasonably practicable. Uh, it is not uh, possible there is a uh, typographical error. The last P there is practicable, so which means you are looking to do uh, what is practically possible to minimize uh, methane emission. Emphasis on closed vents, not, not venting into the atmosphere, and maximum recovery if there is an incident, uh, uh, quick intervention. Adherence to international standards for design and equipment selection that emphasize tight methane containment. So uh, in selecting your critical equipment like valves and compressors and uh, control valves, stuff like that, you uh, use the, uh, select those equipment that will give you a tighter control on uh, emission uh, of uh, methane. Um, during the design process, I will uh, uh, pro, uh, suggest that uh, we have uh, a review session that looks, that focuses on methane management and other uh, environmental uh, issues that could be mitigated at the design stage. Uh, 
if we do this review and take into account uh, available uh, technologies that meet and possibly exceed the uh, uh, emission uh, management standards at the design stage, that will help. So, but when the plant is already constructed, uh, like all the uh, plants that we have for, uh, currently operating, there should be a plant-wide monitoring and detection system that address uh, fugitive emissions and leaks for prompt intervention. Uh, the operator of, uh, of the plant should have a culture of continuous improvement in reducing methane emission uh, leading to asset uh, ISO certification. When you do your environmental management uh, certification of your plant, it will help you to ensure that uh, you mitigate all uh, waste and uh, uh, methane, uh, any methane that is uh, uh, emitted from your plant is a waste. And you don't want, really you want the methane to be a uh, part of your, uh, what you are selling to your customers. And you don't want them escaping, I mean, want you escaping into the atmosphere. So I, I've already talked about uh, the uh, new uh, projects, but uh, there's a need to ensure that when you are doing monitoring for improvement, that you actually keep uh, uh, base data so that you can measure your performance. And uh, the government regulatory agencies need to play uh, a very key role by ensuring, by ensuring that they monitor the operators to ensure that they comply with uh, the statutory regulations and limits concerning emission so that uh, people, uh, the operators, will know that yes, indeed, they have uh, uh, a responsibility to discharge their, uh, uh, in discharging their responsibility towards the climate uh, management. So, uh, developing uh, baseline emission data, implementing emission commitment strategy, setting targets, monitoring your performance, and it, uh, it is advisable uh, that we should uh, retrofit proven technologies uh, to detect gas, like the uh, OGI optical gas uh, imaging, and then the, uh, we, we also have a method 21 uh, using a flame ionization detector to detect uh, emission and, uh, and do something about it. I think this is about the, the last slide. And then uh, thank you for uh, listening to my presentation. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I think that's going to be a, a lot of material for us to go back to in the Q&A session. I, I was reflecting as you talked about uh, a LARP as, as low as reasonably possible. Uh, you know, I think uh, there could be a broad consensus that that's uh, the way that we should go. But then, of course, the, the devil is in what is reasonable and, and how yeah. we come up with uh, a way to operationalize that and make it apply to a given context. And I do want to loop back to that, but I, I think it, you know, providing your, your engineer's perspective and the benefit of, of your experience in these plants, I think is 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 a really interesting one that uh, you know is going to enrich the conversation as we move forward. Um, perhaps I can go to the uh, final speaker today, uh, Dr. Mark uh, Thurber. And he is the associate director of the program on energy and sustainable development, uh, PESD, and is a lecturer in management at Stanford University. And he studies and teaches about energy and environmental markets and policy. He's written and edited books and articles on natural gas markets, uh, integration of renewables and electricity markets, future of coal, national oil companies, climate policy, uh, provision of energy services to low income populations, and uh, in his capacity as a fellow for, at Energy for Growth Hub. He's published policy pieces on the potential role of natural gas in developing countries, given talks in Nigeria and Ghana about strategies uh, to overcome constraints in the gas to value 
uh, Guest to Power Value Chain. His most recent book, uh, 2019, uh, is uh, examines why coal has uh, remained the, uh, the preeminent fuel for energy electricity generation around the world, uh, even though you know it's it's uh, not not great for air quality and, and the global climate. He does teach a course in energy markets and policy at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford, uh, which is uh, uh, centered on game-based simulation of uh, electricity, carbon, and renewable energy markets, and, and has conducted game-based workshops for policymakers, regulators, and, and industry stakeholders, including energy officials from Nigeria, Ghana, and Brazil. And I think uh, it's great to have you sort of adding cleanup in the, the speaker profile because, of course, you're you're bringing, I suppose, on the one hand, this kind of practical markets um, orientation, um, but also this kind of fascinating game perspective, uh, which says, how do we get the pieces in place? How do we make this work systemically? Indeed, how do we write the rules of the game in order to be able to move forward with the emissions abatement? So look, really looking forward to your comments, uh, uh, Mark. Great, thanks very much, Stephen. Um, so yeah, you know, I've I've really enjoyed this this session so far, and also yesterday, I thought there were just some really interesting points that, that stim were stimulating for me. Uh, and I think this morning, you know, it's great. I think Jared did a terrific job of laying out where some things are going, both on detection and mitigation technologies for methane leaks, and then it was really complimentary, I think, to hear Bio talk about what are the practicalities of implementing uh, some of these things in, in uh, the African context. So, so I thought that was a great setup. So I thought I would take a step back and uh, expand my remit a little bit, even to get into electricity a bit and, and CO2 as well as methane, and just offer a few quick thoughts on the theme of fostering innovation in Africa and what kinds of innovation we might expect to potentially come out of Africa uh, as, as well as uh, like what we talked about this morning, where we can apply innovations from elsewhere uh, to, to, to the African context. And I think two points that have already been made before, but I think are really uh, important context, both uh, Wale and Bertrand yesterday, I think set the context very well of the fact that the total uh, greenhouse gas emissions from Africa are a very small piece of the overall pie. So I think we need to, to bear that in mind. And also, I, I really liked uh, Bio's point that it's important to remember that in a lot of places in Africa, uh, the default really will be diesel. Um, you know, if, if things aren't set up well with sort of a centralized energy uh, delivery system. So, uh, so I just wanted to mention mention those things. So, I guess how I tried to come at this is: what are the conditions in which innovation in Africa is both attractive uh, to to African countries, and also what are some places where African countries have advantages in leading in innovation? So, I kind of divided this into three broad categories of kinds of innovation. And so the first one I would say is technology innovation where the technology is likely to be, to be quite expensive. Um, and so these are areas where I think to the extent that we want this innovation to happen in Africa or we want it to be quickly applied, this is gonna need some financial and other support from, from outside countries. And so this to me broadly, I would think of things like, uh, you know, blending hydrogen, thinking about uh, moving, you know, from, from gas to hydrogen, uh, things like CCUS, which I'm excited to hear more about later today. Um, so these are areas really where this is quite cutting edge technology wise, cutting edge, trying to get costs down. Uh, and so, you know, we shouldn't really expect Africa to, to lead in, in the innovation process in these areas because it's simply too expensive. Uh, energy storage would, or electricity storage would be another one I would put in that category. So I think in this first category, to the extent that we want this to happen fast, there need to be mechanisms for large financial transfers uh, to, to push this. 
And so, you know, one policy mechanism that was trying to do that was the clean development mechanism under Kyoto, which involved, in effect, you know, ways of, of doing, doing transfers of, of funds to make these things happen outside of the, the countries in Europe covered by the, the Kyoto Protocol. There were a lot of problems with offset programs and in CDM, which we can get into, but, but that's broadly the idea, I think, of what you need to make very expensive things happen. The second category of innovation uh, is, I think, what the, the kinds of innovation that we just covered, that Jared and Bio were talking about. And these are things that aren't necessarily very expensive um, and are things where there are some real advantages to applying in a more nascent uh, gas market context. And so I thought, that, you know, I think this example of methane leak detection and methane leak mitigation, I think this is potentially a, a very suitable, I mean, both for Africa to quickly deploy innovations elsewhere and maybe also some innovation, at least in systems, could happen in Africa with the benefit that, you know, with, a, with being at an earlier stage of, of developing gas markets, you, uh, you know, can, can get in the, the best technologies, maybe you have fewer point sources to, to monitor, um, and, and you can deploy some, some technologies right off the bat. And I think this is a super uh, interesting and, and promising area because I think a lot of, you know, as, as Jared was talking about, I think there are going to be a lot of advantage, uh, advances in methane leak detection technology over the next 10 years. And, and so I think this is a, a really promising area of application. Um, and then, you know, also I think what, what Jared and Bio both talked about, there's the technical side but also the operational institutional side. And I think that latter is, is maybe something that we need to pay particular attention to in the African context, well, as well as you know, the American context and everywhere else, but just how we can make sure that, that there is sort of uh, you know, implementation and continued uh, stewardship of, of these kinds of efforts for methane leak detection. So then the, the last, kind of category that that I would say for for innovation that I think is very, very important in the African context and where maybe there is some potential for leapfrogging, uh, which was a topic of discussion yesterday, is these sort of systems uh, kinds of innovation. And one thing I want to bring up in particular is electricity grids uh, and and so this is another case where you know in Africa some of these you know might maybe less developed than in the US or or Europe or other places which is also an opportunity and so Kenya is a great example here of where Kenya is moving very fast in 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 deployment of utility scale renewables uh, you know Ghana is another example that's moving pretty fast in this area and so this is also posing some some real problems because the grid and the grid management capabilities are not yet you know on par with with what's needed so, so in some sense these countries are leapfrogging ahead with with much less mature grids and so there are opportunities here to develop the grid in a in accordance with this high renewables paradigm you know unlike in the US and most other places the the old grid paradigm is you put large central station fossil fuel plants where the people were, and then you move around the fossil fuels to get them to their plants. And that, you know, so that results in a transmission network that looks a certain way. Uh, but now we have an opportunity in these countries that are moving so fast in renewables to, to you know, develop a transmission grid that's, that's more appropriate for renewables. I think most likely that open cycle gas turbines uh, are likely to play a very important part in assuring reliability in that kind of grid. And I think an important part of systems level innovation is instead of just looking at a particular technology and saying, oh, open cycle gas turbine, that's less efficient than a combined cycle gas turbine, it's higher emitting. If you look at it in a systems level way, you think, well, but this is a different paradigm. This is the paradigm where now we want to have as much as many re electrons from renewable energy as we can, and the the gas plants are providing reliability services. And I think in that context, 
the open cycle gas turbine, it's much less likely to be a, a stranded asset, um, you know, much, much better part of that overall system innovation. Um, and I guess I would just, just uh, call back to something that I thought was a really great contribution from, from Andrew yesterday, talking about this geothermal partnership with, with Kenya and the success that, that that has had. And I think that's a great model for thinking about these kinds of system innovation. And especially to me, uh, grid management uh, capability, I think is an area where a lot of uh, African countries could, could use assistance with. And so, you know, I'd love to have that take a similar path of, of sort of a partnership um, on improving capability of, of grid management, which is going to be very, very important for this, this high renewables future that, that we uh, hope uh, Africa can move quickly on as well. So those are, those are my quick thoughts, and I'm happy to, to talk more about anything people want to. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and I think it's interesting to move into to Q and A, and and I'm I'm disappointed in a way we only have about ten minutes for for Q and A. So what I want to try and do is is set up what I hope will be a, an extremely provocative question, and and then ask all three of our panelists uh, in turn to respond. And and let me set up the discussion in this way. Uh, I worked for a number of years in in Angola. And uh, we didn't really have to go to a great deal of effort to find where the emissions were because uh, I certainly remember flying in at uh, early morning hours uh, time and time again from uh, uh, Paris and seeing flares lit up all along the African coast as we moved uh, toward Luanda. And indeed, uh, our primary uh, producing platform uh, was flaring gas, uh, flaring so much gas that it actually melted the life preserver um, that had been uh, too close to the radius as we ramped up production. And our operations manager hung the life preserver on the wall as part of his justification for improving the flare. Uh, so what do we do over time? Uh, uh, we did the Angola LNG project. And the Angola LNG project uh, was not just uh, applying technology. It was innovating um, technology in, in an important way, uh, which is that it uh, used multiple fields, uh, associated gas, uh, different operators, and tried to put all that piece together, uh, which was not just saying, let's find some technology and use it in Africa. It's you're trying to find a specific solution there. Uh, but also, those of you who followed that project, it was an extremely difficult project with uh, lengthy delays, um, heavy cost overruns, uh, huge operational problems, great difficulties in putting together the commercial structure, uh, indeed a, a plethora of, of difficulties. So in that context, I really want to loop back to this idea of challenges and opportunities in Africa and ask each of you a question. And that question is, if you could do one thing, one thing to maximize the abatement of natural gas emissions in Africa, what would that one thing be? And it could be an innovation. It could be an application of technology. It could be a removal of barriers. But let's hear it. You, you get one shot, one bite of the apple. What's that going to be? So perhaps, to Jared, we could start with you. I think you're on mute. Yep, I'm on. Sorry. Um, so the answer to that, I mean, one approach could be what is the near term? The easiest answer is lowest hanging fruit. If you mentioned flares or concentrated sources, so whether it's um, bypass from methane from flares, uncombustible flares, or even just the CO2 emissions, um, that's a component that's easy identifiable. And there are technology solutions, not necessarily um, you can't get pipelines, access to pipelines from certain locations. But there are mitigation applications to the flaring. So one solution would be where are the highest concentrated emitters to go after that? I think the long-term challenges are the areas such as orphan wells or the very remote areas, pneumatic controllers, where the emissions are small and they're very remote. So um, I, I guess it's, it's to help support the social license to operate the sustainability of really, and it's actually both a regulatory driver 
of really regulating the flares and the policies behind that. And then also following up with an econ economical driver that industry wants to mitigate that flare, that re rely that resource. Again, so I'm relating to the U.S. application of you know, why are they flaring, you know, this associated gas, uh, concentrated streams. Well, because it's not cost effective and it's not regulated in certain areas. Well, those are two easy things to overcome as one is you need to put some regulations into place on those flares and then can follow within technology solutions. That, that, that would be our, you know, what are the highest easy to mitigate first movers? You're, you're on mute, uh, Steve. Are you there? You might be on mute still. Steven, I th are you are you back? Uh, do you hear me? Yep. Yeah, now we do, yeah. Yeah, okay, sorry about that. Um, just uh, wanted to toss it to Bio and, and uh, see how he uh, responded to this, what his thoughts are. Does he agree with you? Does, uh, what would he, uh, what would his one thing be? Yeah, um, hmm. I would say that uh, one thing that could help uh, to uh, mitigate emission is um, deployment of uh, technology into existing plants. Uh, I, was, I believe that right now we have so many plants producing gas or treating associated gas and uh, looking to the future, I, I don't believe we will have more new plants than we already have in existence. So uh, I'm making sure that the existing plants are operated and retrofitted with uh, uh, new technologies to detect and stop emission for me we uh, uh, we do more good to the environment than uh, uh, we currently have. Okay, uh, thank you for that. And and then uh, finally over to you, Mark. Uh, what is your uh, your take on the uh, on the one best thing to do? Sure, sure. Well, and and I just wanted to start by saying, Stephen, like I thought your example of the Angola LNG project. Like that's a great example, I think, of the of the innovation opportunity where it is kind of this more systems innovation, uh, playing off what the specific problems are. But you also point out another excellent point that these tend to be extremely expensive and and uh, you know kind of go over cost targets because you could say exactly the same thing about the innovation you know happening right now with Kenya and renewables and you know so there's always sort of a lot of dissatisfaction when you're in it because it's just it's really hard uh, but but I think also important opportunities um yeah I liked I liked the the uh the the suggestions by by Jared and and bio I guess I would come back again to um related to flaring you know, having a model for power of of putting in more open cycle gas turbines um, in you know near populated areas in in some of these countries that are trying to be high renewables, because I think as everyone kind of is implicitly pointing out, flaring comes from uh, you know associated gas plus underdeveloped gas applications uh, plus uh, just just distances and rapidly changing gas markets. I always like to point out that the U.S. right now in total is flaring more than Nigeria. So uh, you know I think that's that's an important context. Um, but but to me that's and, and it's really tough. I mean developing gas markets and gas infrastructure and financing them. This is another really really challenging problem. But but to me. You know, until so, you know, having followed Nigeria for for a number of years, you know, working on on a project about Nigerian oil sector, you know, the flaring targets keep getting pushed back, but it's no different anywhere else. the The problem is that that just whenever you have associated gas and nothing to do with it, uh, that the the oil still gets developed and you, you still have nothing to do with the gas. So so you know, to mm -hmm. me, I think one of the levers, in addition to what you know my co-panelist said, is is what are some some gas applications and and uh, you know I think open cycle gas turbines is is one I mean I think certainly petrochemicals is another but uh... 
and if I might throw in my two cents, and I just I see we just have one minute left. Um, I, I was really impressed and impacted by a, a chart that uh, Bertrand showed yesterday, um, which showed just how much uh, coal-fired power gen has increased in middle-income countries. Um, so, in a way, I'm tempted to say the best thing that Africa could do to reduce emissions is to increase emissions. That is to say, increase its own emissions through developing uh, its natural resources, but finding a way to cost effectively then drive down um, the uh, the coal heavy coal focus in in uh, middle income countries and make a, a a positive contribution to the global uh, energy balance. And I think too, uh, looking at the trade dimensions and the global uh, impact is is also quite quite critical as as we try to to wrestle with these and come up with the, the best uh, solutions for uh, for individual countries and stakeholders, but uh, for the entire uh, globe. So I think uh, that yeah. passes, uh, through the time that we had there, I, I just want to take the opportunity to really thank uh, um, all three of the participants for their insightful comments and, and uh, thoughtful answers to the question. And, and then I'll, I'll hand it back uh, to the uh, to the overall uh, moderator. Yes. Thank you, Jared Thank Bio you. and Dr. Serber. I uh, really appreciate your contributions as speakers today. And a uh, special thanks to you as well, Stephen. For those of you that didn't see the chat, I did an, an introduction to Stephen uh, with his background. He, he is the Global Consulting Manager uh, with LNG and Natural Gas for Potent Partners. Uh, he leads the global team of LNG and Natural Gas Advisors out of Houston since 2019. He was the Consulting Manager for the Asia Pacific region. Uh, back in 2011 through 2018, uh, based in Australia and a senior consultant in New York from, from 05 to 2010. Uh, he specializes in providing strategic, financial, and commercial advice for the development of liquefaction and LNG import terminal projects, as well as LNG supply sourcing and marketing. Before joining Potent, Stephen was exploration and production manager for Chevron in Colombia, leading a business providing for 90% of Colombia's natural gas needs. Uh, Stephen also served as fiscal and planning manager for Texaco and Angola during a period when it more than doubled its oil production. Stephen does have a master's in law and diplomacy from Tufts University, a master's in international business from the University of South Carolina, and a BA in international economics. So moving thank on to the much. next session. Yeah, thank you for your efforts today. We really appreciated it. Uh, I don't know if Johan Van Dyke is on or not. Uh, Johan, are you on? Anthony, I don't see him. Uh, let me make sure he's not accidentally in as an attendee. But I don't okay. see him. Steven, I'm not sure if you're available to run this session or not, uh, if we don't have Johan. But if you are, would you be willing? Sure. I, I obviously haven't uh, prepared for it as I did the other one, but uh, yeah. happy to help out if necessary. Yeah, yeah. So it's the uh, this this uh, session is called development of added value markets. And yeah, since he's not here, I, we really appreciate you helping us out. And why don't we go ahead and, and uh, why don't we go ahead and move on to the speakers here, uh, Miss Olu Verhijen, managing director, Latimer Energy, uh, also entrepreneur in residence for Energy for Growth Hub. And we have Dr. Daniel Haynes, who is a senior scientist in the Reaction Engineering Team, which is part of the Energy Conversion Engineering Division at NETL. Uh, he falls under our Research and Innovation Center, uh, which is part of NETL's, uh, one of the national laboratories here under DOE in the Fossil Energy Carbon Management uh, Organization. Uh, so why don't we go ahead and, and kick it off to the speakers to give their presentations. Thank you. Uh, um, Zola, would you be willing to start then? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, can you see me and hear me? I hear you fine. Okay, great. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for that kind intro introduction, Anthony. Um, yes, I think uh, I'm happy to, to get started on the, on the topic here. I think it's around development of um, added value markets, and I think we wanted to um, have the conversation really around, you know, how you convert stranded gas um, 
um, to say, um, you know, reduce, you know, your utilization of, I mean, to increase utilization of lead gas. Um, and, you know, talk about how, you know, infrastructure, you know, infrastructure needs and what kinds of um, incentives. So I'll, tar I'll start by explaining just the need, for example, yeah, um, that in general, there's, there's, an, there's a huge need for GAP. And I think the previous um, panel um, has already talked about several things um, happening um, in the power sector, particularly, but there is also a need in uh, of gas uh, for gas as feedstock. Um, so, you know, to demonstrate that need, for example, you can see that, um, you know, the, there are only four nitrogen-based fertilizer plants um, across the uh, across the continent, um, despite its huge reserves. Um, and, you know, it's not that we have significant use of fertilizer; we're seven times below the global average. Um, so there, there is there is need. Um, you know, agriculture plays a, a big role. It's um, you know employs fifty four percent of Africa's workforce and constitutes about twenty three percent of the GDP. So an opportunity investing in that space, um, in feedstock and fertilizers and ammonia, um, definitely has a potential for significant economic impact um, on the continent. So the question isn't really, and uh, you know, so the question is if the need is there and the resource base is clearly there, why is there a gap to potential, um, to realizing those, uh, that potential and, the, and, that, and that opportunity? Um, and so for that, I'll take, I'd like to take a step back from the question being uh, focused around how to monetize stranded gas and fled gas, but in general, what the challenges are around commercializing gas uh, for any purpose, um, whether it is, you know, for power or for, um, you know, for, for, for feedstock, um, for industrial, other types of industrial use. Um, most of the um, resources that have been found, whether you're talking about Angola, um, Nigeria, um, in Algeria, Algeria stopped exporting in Mozambique, for example, most of those gas resources are exported, they're commercialized via exports. In fact, Nigeria, Mark was mentioning the fact that Nigeria flares less um, than the US. That is true. And the trajectory of Nigeria's flares, if you follow it, you can see that it's um, directly correlated with the fact that its energy import exports were growing at the same time. So with the right incentives, the right commercial framework, um, a 10 year tax holiday doesn't hurt. And if you're the, of those types of things, you can commercialize gas. I think it's that challenge around working through the issues that um, the commercial and regulatory issues that would enable financing and attract financing to solving some of these challenges that that's sort of where understanding those things in much uh, much clearer detail is sort of how you would unlock that. Um, so, you know, um, one of the ways I think so the, the key, the dynamic in this market isn't necessarily around. So, yes, the previous um, speakers have talked about technology applications, whether it's innovation or whether it's adaptation of technology, um, you know, or even a, a, yeah, an adaptation of technology as demonstrated by the Angola example that was talking that was talked about where it's, it's go be, goes beyond adaptation and um, involves some levels of innovation, at least at a systems level. All of those things and the solutions are there. You find that the connect, it's not necessarily that, that we don't have the answers around how to physically address this, especially when it comes to things like flood gas, or why is there not enough gas being consumed locally? There's a separate problem um, to that. So we, we clearly know how to abate um, flares because we've done that in Nigeria's example but, um, by commercializing it via NLNG. Um, the challenge is tends to be two, two different two different ones. The wider systemic challenge really around commercializing gas and especially improving utilization of gas, whether it's for export or for domestic consumption, but particularly around domestic consumption, because as I've said, most of the gas that we have here is exported. But why is it not being so those flares are related to exports? It's not on the on the first part, I think um, when you take places like Nigeria. It was mainly an oil province, right? And so a lot of it is associated gas as has been identified. So initially, a lot of these, um, the regulator did not insist in that one, there were not ma major ways to commercialize this gas. So if you don't design ab initio in your um, field development plans, um, in, your, in how you're developing your oil, how you're going to commercialize your gas, you end up with um, a much more expensive, difficult solution. Um, Post um, um, oil produce, so post uh, production. So that's one of the challenges that you've had. The second one has been the distance to market. We don't have adequate infrastructure. 
the market here is not, the local market is not developed enough. Um, there's not enough credit worthy uptake within the local market that allows you to finance some of the technical solutions that are available so that you can make commercial profit on, you know, capturing those flares um, in the ways that make sense. So the distance to market, the technology solutions, when you overlay that with the ability to finance and commercialize, commercialize those things profitably, um, that tends to be a challenge. But the bigger systemic problem really is really um, the fact that there are no, um, I think, in a, where we talk about the fact that, you know, there's a lot of flares, <clears throat> Um, um, or that, you know, you know, how do we, um, you know, what are the other value added markets that you can create? I think in that conversation, we definitely need to get into why there isn't enough um, domestic co consumption of gas, given the needs of the African continent and how to resolve those and, and clarity around those problems and the challenges is sort of where you'll also find the opportunities is sort of how you navigate the opportunities. So, for example, one of the questions here was just really around how you um, repurpose um, 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 uh, existing infrastructure. The challenge in this market is that we don't have sufficient infrastructure, so we can, we're not really at the point where we're thinking of how to repurpose gas infrastructure yet. We don't have sufficient infrastructure. So the innovation and the thinking here is really around how do you come up with, um, you know, use technologies like small-scale LNG and CNG to close that infrastructure gap and do a better job of connecting uh, bridging the distances between gas sources and gas markets and to do so commercially. Like I said, a lot of those technologies that, um, um, are out there. It is whether or not they can be deployed in a commercially viable way. That is usually the challenge. Um, so you can transport it. And some of the challenges with LNG is that, yes, you can do infrastructure, you can do it. You have a few entrepreneurs in this market now trying to bridge that gap and increase gas utilization. And, and a lot of the, the gas flare programs and how to monetize um, gas flares also is try to, is try, a lot of them are framing their opportunities around gas flares as well and commercializing glass gas flares. And one of the things they're trying, a few things they're trying to do there is to export, to transport um, LNG via existing infrastructure. There's roads, rails, um, and small scale regas facility and have small scale regas facilities in their end users. For CNG, you don't require the sort of low temperature uh, for storage and regas facilities, but their efficiency trade-offs because as your distance between, um, it's and it's more suitable essentially for, for shorter distances. While you use, you'll use LNG for much longer distances. So you have people in Nigeria, you have people using that within the market um, to, uh, from the market <coughs> um, to, to move gas from the north, uh, from the south, most of the gas resources are in the coast, all the way into the north, um, or the northern part of the country where there's less infrastructure. So a lot of this opportunity, so there's, there are a few things that that allows. Um, it allows you to, this, these are useful applications for, for some of the technologies that are out there and as long as it can be commercial. The fact that the energy transition is sort of limiting the amount of investments coming into fossil fuels means that you can do this small scale um, solutions um, as an incremental approach versus big grid systems, but you have to think of the long term of how to incorporate these things into the grid, into a grid system eventually, um, because, you know, you can't achieve the level of growth and economic development that we're thinking about at the scale that is necessary um, on this continent uh, without that grid, um, without that sort of systems level um, um, exist, um, investments. But starting at this small scale stage um, and, and this incremental approach is definitely uh, one of the ways to do so. Um, in terms of the incentives and communicated incentives, I think, you know, again, let's take the Nigeria example, given that they're sort of the largest resource holder here uh, in the sub-region. I think that, that, that there, you know, after 20 years, they've recently passed a um, 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 uh, Petroleum um, Investment Act that is supposed to incentivize um, um, and, do, and does quite a bit in addressing some of the challenges there and sort of incentivizes them that, that should incentivize investment in opportunities in gas particularly. Um, there's a clear intent there to make sure that gas is the transition, it's to, to, that is gas serves as a transition fuel um, and displaces diesel um, and bio traditional mass, um, uh, tra traditional biomass. But, um, you know, the question is whether or not that bill has come um, too late, right? If they wider um, financing community is looking to limit investments into um, and the major oil uh, international oil companies are looking to reduce their exposure um, to oil and gas then 
even though this bill has a lot of incentives in it, will it um, address, is it, has it come too late is, is sort of the question um, in addressing some of the challenges around infrastructure, around approved re uh, regulatory um, environment, um, some of the pricing mechanisms, quite a bit of incentives, you know, some of them, you know, no royalties There's an infrastructure fund that's this, that's supposed to be seeded now to ensure that you address that infrastructure issue on a systemic level, they're trying to address, you know, their third party um, access via the a network code as well, um, that's supposed to allow um, you to, um, to use um, standalone systems under the, the um, under utilized capacity and standalone systems until there is a wider network um, of gas infrastructure that enables higher utilization and monetization and commercialization of all the volumes that we're talking about. Um, the key question, of course, is whether or not um, financing partners, with the, with be it um, development finance um, so, um, institutions or uh, private sector investors, um, um, will have um, will al allocate capital given um, that the energy transition has picked up. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm not sure. Is Johan uh, on the line to pick up the moderating or should I continue? No, he hasn't had any luck uh, logging in yet. He's still having bandwidth issues. So um, if you want to continue, Steve. Certainly. Okay. Thank you very much, Olu. And then um, perhaps I turn it over to uh, Dr. Daniel Haynes, who's a senior scientist for the Reaction Engineering Team, Energy Conservation Engineering Division. Research and Innovation Center at the NETL. I can share my screen. Um, not seeing the option here to share my screen. You should have it now, Dan. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so thank you uh, again for the introduction. Again, my name is Dan Haynes. Uh, I'm a researcher on the uh, Reaction Engineering team at, at, at NETL. And I'll just be um, kind of highlighting how uh, we have uh, you know, at, at DOE some government-sponsored research um, in, our, in our oil and gas program that, that uh, can showcase how uh, government can help um, address challenges of gas flaring and, and with the development of new technologies. And so um, we're looking at some of the um, – oops, I should um, – I just forgot to turn on my camera. I apologize for that. Um, and um, okay. Um, and so I think it's everyone's pretty well aware that associated natural gas is a byproduct of oil production and um, so the uh, countries that produce the most oil uh, also account for a significant amount of gas flaring. And, and so according to the World Bank report we've uh, shown here that recently put out this year, um, that the seven countries, although they account for 40% of the oil, oil production each year, they, they do account for nearly two thirds of global gas flaring. And, and just to kind of reiterate, you know, flaring occurs for different uh, reasons or safety and operation of, of the well. There's also economic reasons that are um, due to lack of infrastructure where there's, um, you know, geographic, the, the wells are geographic, geographically constrained or they are, um, you know, there's spacing between the wells that makes it difficult to put takeaway capacity over. There's also even uh, issues where there's, you know, in the U.S. anyway, there's issues where production capacity exceeds the takeaway. So there actually is, but it's just difficult to, to size the wells amount of gas production. So. There's various economic reasons for for flaring, and that's predominantly that routine the, re, the predominant reason why uh, flaring occurs. Uh, and so we have um, some uh, reasons why flaring needs to be reduced. It's basically inefficient, and it's a waste of national resources. It's a point source for greenhouse gas emissions like CO2, and if it's vented, <clears throat> vented, then uh, you know the natural gas with the natural gas and liquids have higher uh, warming potentials than the CO2. There's also lost revenue uh, for the oil and gas producers and mineral rights owners. And then there's also uh, lost tax revenue for local and state and federal government. Uh, 
Um, and it's also a point source emission for volatile organic compounds uh, and other ha hazardous air emissions like the nitrogen oxides and sulfur oxides. And it's also just an unsustainable business practice, as we've heard before, like, the, um, you know, it's no longer going to be an, a de decision to maximize profits. It's going to have to be uh, companies and investors are tying uh, environmental and social justice um, practices of companies to investment dollars and consumers are, um, you know, increasing demand for sustainability for uh, you know, the, the uh, oil production and, and, and missions associated with it. So um, I thought this was a good snapshot to describe what the different things that can be done with um, with flare gas. And so it's possible to re-inject the gas um, back into the well. It's, it's a common practice. Uh, it can also be utilized uh, compressed natural gas, uh, trucking, like virtual pipeline uh, takeaway. Uh, there's also the ability to produce power on, on site locally that's used at the wellhead, or there's also the ability to, um, you know, power send power back to the grid if the infrastructure is in place. And then then there's ways to recover and utilize it as a feedstock, and that's so what we're we're kind of looking at here is, and, and we have work sponsoring, um, and so that is um, mainly over here in the in the right here with with the uh, green and kind of purple, where you can make different fuels. Uh, there's different um, uh, reactions and things that, that can be make different fuels like diesel, uh, methanol, uh, ammonia synthesis. All these different products can be made uh, out of flare gas. So it offers it uh, offers a, a way to, to monetize this, this wasted resource. Um, and it, but these, this isn't without challenges, um, significant challenges um, that are uh, often difficult for uh, to overcome. And so the, the primary issue is that these but wells are very uh, uh, erratic in their production of gas uh, and gas production. Um, and essentially, there is, if you can look at the figure down here, there is this um, uh, production of of the well that uh, it, it basically has a, a, a steep increase, and then it, it actually has a significant drop off. So I think there's a, a rough estimate of 50% of the production of the well drops off. At around six months, so it makes it difficult to size equipment. Even within the daily operation of the well, the fluctuations are significant, and there can be times when there's really no uh, um, production of, oil, of gas at all. And then the compositional variation is very um, uh, difficult to. Uh, it varies significantly between wells and even wells within the same basin, so it makes it difficult again for a process, these traditional processes to handle these types of systems. Uh, we do have systems available today that can convert these uh, components that are in natural gas, like methane and ethane, to value-added chemicals. Um, they are, however, efficient and cost-effective at large scales, and they're typically uh, employed in the petrochemical industry. If you think about, like, a steam reformer or a uh, ammonium synthesis plant or a uh, ethane cracker, they're all really large centralized facilities. They're very happy with very standard uh, very uh, uniform feeds, uh, uniform temperatures, and, and very steady flow rates. And so turning them off and on to handle these flows is not very uh, efficient. And so there's a need for new technologies that need to be developed um, that have new uh, catalytic materials, new technologies like um, plasmas and microwaves that can enable electrification of, of uh, these conversion processes that can pair with renewables uh, and also um, just being able to handle the intermittency of the of the flows, and then just new reactor designs that have um, process intensification benefits. And so I'm just going to look a little bit more into this, uh, what these systems must have. And so they need to be uh, small and compact to be on the well site. There's not much room for these uh, for, for on, on space on a well site. So these systems need to be small, containerized, almost mounted onto a skid or a, trail, a tractor trailer. Uh, they need to be integrated to have all the Processing steps combined, so uh, we call this processing uh, in intensification, where you can improve efficiencies um, in, in smaller volumes by combining components or improving heat integration. So that's what's kind of shown here, um, where you can shrink the reactor size by making things more integrated with uh, having more heat or better heat integration, and also having multifunctional equipment where you can combine unit operations like in this case, you have a, re a separate reactor and a separator, and you combine them together to have some kind of membrane that could do reactive separation or something like that. Uh, then there's modularity where the system um, can be easily assembled and disassembled and transported between sites. We saw on the previous slide that the flows are very, um, they, they can, there's a steep incline, incline decrease in the flows and they're very erratic 
um, but the but 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 there's a very steep drop off, and so you may not need to have these systems stay at a site for very long. To be, uh, and and would, they can be easily moved to transport to another site when uh, the production drops off. And they also need to be uh, operable to handle a, a wide range of, of rapidly changing conditions. As we saw the flow rates and the compositions are very um, erratic and, and can vary widely. So these systems need to be able to handle all of those. And they just need to be employing advanced um, manufacturing methods like uh, additive manufacturing and, and um, 3D printing to be able to just make uh, uh, repairs to these systems in remote locations very, uh, very simple. Um, and so this is the focus. So we're sponsoring some uh, some of this work and through the Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management through our upcycling program. And, and so we're developing technologies to minimize waste um, of natural gas resources um, and mitigating greenhouse gases through practices like like flaring, and um, and so the mission of this work work is to develop chemical processes and modular reactors that are that efficiently and economically convert wellhead natural gas to higher value products that can be more readily brought to market than, than the natural gas itself. Um, and the need for this work uh, is basically that there's uh, the conversion of natural gas into valuable chemicals would help the industry by enabling profit of of an otherwise wasted resource and um, it would also help in, uh, mitigate the environmental impact caused by flaring. And so this is, we're doing this by developing process intensified solutions that are these modular systems that can be deployed, uh, deployed at remote locations. We can, uh, and this also is done by creating these new catalytic materials that have significant improvements in natural, natural gas conversion and, and, and producing valuable solid products uh, and, and liquid products that are easier to transport than the gas itself. Um, and then we also have transform into process integration, advanced manufacturing concepts that can lead to these industry industry changing commercial systems, these modular uh, systems that can enable decentralized chemical production um, in, in remote locations. Uh, and so this is a snapshot of our existing research portfolio. Uh, so we have 12 total projects um, that are uh, separated by liquids and, and hydrogen solid carbon products. Um, this can um, Basically, uh, liquid products. We're looking at uh, methanol and aromatics. And a lot of so a lot of this work is really uh, low, um, early early level research, very uh, proof of concept studies on these new catalyst materials, as well as uh, new technologies like plasmas and microwaves and, and photocatalysis. So proving these technologies because um, a lot of this research is going to take a lot. Of, it's really early stages, so it'll take some time to develop. So. Um, and then we also have some some of these this work that is going to that is a little bit further along um, in in um, in development. And so it's it's kind of proving these uh, technologies on on a, on a larger scale. And so uh, we also have an internal program in our re, in our research innovation center in our in our uh, in house research program um, center at, at NATL. And it's a similar type of work, uh, early uh, TRL work that we have, uh, early stage research that's looking at. Uh, development of new catalysts for uh, hydrogen and carbon pr in, or paralysis for, of the uh, natural gas into hydrogen and carbon. Um, and then we have a, uh, a plasma and olefin space process, which is a crater between uh, Sustian, Seton Hall, and uh, NETL. And we're work it's working on looking at um, the, the development. Uh, Sustian and, and Seton Hall are working on a plasma based process. And, and NATL is working on the uh, the olefin space process, and then we have this uh, microwave process that's looking at the de development optimization of microwave catalysts for uh, aromatics production. And then we do have a uh, an associated natural gas mitigation assessment, which is a task that's doing a market survey on liquid-based chemical intermediates, and that is looking at identifying emerging markets for additional chemicals that we can start to develop uh, new systems and technologies for. And so, with that, take any questions. Um, concludes my talk. Thank you very much. I, I want to, do want to get back to you with a with a question, but but perhaps I I, I yeah. move back to Olu to begin with. Um, you know, I, I I didn't have time to to get to know you as well as I, I would, but your your profile, just from the little I see here, is is quite uh, quite fascinating um, as, as entrepreneur in in residence, and I want to talk about entrepreneurship in. In developing these value-added markets, as an entrepreneur, and I presume you know focused on Africa, what is it that you most need to be successful? What are the conditions that 
that entrepreneurs require to develop these value added markets and, and what's missing? Um, or indeed, would you say that actually this isn't going to be something where the entrepreneurs are going to take the lead? And what you need is more of a government led top down sort of imposed approach to develop these opportunities. So, uh, really interested to hear your, your feedback and thoughts on that. Uh, Ola. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, yes, my experience is mostly in uh, commercializing, uh, originating and commercializing gas and renewables um, across the African continent. So, I've, I've been involved in certain commercializing or, you know, resolving some of the challenges around commercializing and financing uh, gas projects, whether they're, you know, in, in their various forms, whether it's export or, or domestic use um, and, and various applications as well across the, um, the sector. I, again, I think you'll come back to the systemic um, um, challenges that you have within some of these markets in which you operate and, and and also to understand which markets it is you're trying to commercialize for so if you are trying to commercialize um you know um, lng and just you know uh, regardless of whatever whether you're you know nag fields um ag fields or um, um or just you know commercializing the existing flares um if you are positioned and can afford the investment in um an LNG plant, and and that is going to earn um, um, foreign exchange. For the most part, um, you know that that seems to be easier to finance, as you can see from all of the sort of projects that um, have been financed um, across the continent. Um, so that seems to be easier, and um, and and for the most part, you know th there is an enabling um, government environment that for entrepreneurs, but you know of obviously bigger scale entrepreneurs to make those investments and realize um, commercial profit and also minimize their, their carbon footprint and their impact on the environment. All of those things exist. I think the challenge tends to be around, again, commercialization um, for the domestic market. So um, it is good to see a lot of Daniel, um, um, you know, um, 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 technologies there, and it has all of the, the, you know, the key elements for success that an entrepreneur would be, um, you know, a checklist that, that an entrepreneur has in their mind, modularity, cost efficiency, ability to, um, you know, the fact that you need these things to work in remote areas. I think the challenge there tends to be just the immaturity of the wider um, domestic, once you start thinking about commercializing within domestic markets, so whether that is by putting commercializing a, a flares and, and putting that into a commercial grid, if you're in a remote area, there is no grid connected to you. So you need to figure out a way um, to store that energy and get it to where it can be used. That drives up the cost and makes it difficult to commercialize that, um, that technology, so that those technology um, solutions. So I think for entrepreneurs in this environment, what do they need the most? I think an understanding from, um, you know, uh, there are two things, that, that the government does a better job around um, improving um, and removing some of the bottlenecks around um, the, um, you know, regulatory environment and just the, what the wider investment climate. The infrastructure challenges are real. So if you are trying to commercialize via CNG, um, quite a few of the uh, of people, or some of the people that we know are, are starting to do that as a way to address some of the challenges, whether you're trying to do that via CNG or CNG to power, LNG or you know, small scale LNG, the infrastructure challenge is how to move your, your with, with the, how to move within these markets with the limited infrastructure, whether you're talking about roads, rails, ports, um, intra-Africa trade um, is a challenge and all of those regulatory barriers. Remo removing those things are probably much easier because, again, like I said, the entrepreneurs are entrepreneurial enough to figure out and frame a commercial opportunity and figure out what, what the technologies are that are needed. The barriers tend to be, one, the lack of the infrastructure in a market, a domestic market around, around the continent, the lack of infrastructure um, to monetize that gas uh, and to do so commercially. Um, and then there, that's where the government has quite a big role to play, not necessarily want to catalyze the investments that are needed for that infrastructure to put out the big, the sort of the basic bones uh, of that infrastructure, whether you're talking about roads so that CNG customers, CNG entrepreneurs can move their products much faster, can move it much faster in a cost efficient way to their customers. Um, whether you're talking about LNG, all of those types of things that the government can do to sort of create an enabling environment and remove the barriers to trade will help the entrepreneur, one, not identify the technologies because that tends to be the easy part, to be honest, but 
to frame a commercial opportunity that can attract financing so they can apply their their their, their expertise to making this to, to making these opportunities work. Um, they live here, so it's important for them to to uh, for a lot of the opportunity to, for them to realize these opportunities. And as I demonstrated earlier, the you know the the, the the potential that is there. It's that closing that gap to potential for entrepreneurs tends to be around. The, the fact that there is just not an enabling environment and wider infrastructure within domestic markets um, and credit worthy uptake within those markets to enable financing that they need for them to attract the financing that they need to commercialize this gas. Thank you. Perhaps I, I could move to, to you, Dan, and, and just um, I, I was reflecting, looking at your, your presentation, um, I, I kind of wish I had a dime for every time I saw the word hydrogen uh, over the past year, um, because then yeah. I could easily beat my my um, revenue objectives for this year. And uh, you didn't really see that uh, hydrogen has come out of kind of nowhere. It's not it's not a new technology really, but um, the amount of hype and 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 interest in hydrogen, the amount of attention that's being focused on it, the amount of press that it's giving is quite uh, quite extraordinary. I was wondering if you could give your perspective on that in a couple of ways. First of all, uh, what really are the prospects for blue and green hydrogen? And, and secondly, in, in the African con uh, context, is that is this the solution? Should this be getting the focus? Uh, how should it fit into the order of priorities? Uh, well, I mean, so so we have um, the. That, that's a good question. Um, and so the, the prospects for, for hydrogen, I mean, it's, it's kind of coming around again. I think we saw, you know, when I first started with NETL, it was a, uh, you know, it was the hydrogen economy 15 years ago in the Bush administration. And here we are again, looking to, to uh, have hydrogen, um, you know, enable a, uh, a clean economy. And I think, I think this time around, I think it's, it's a, a legitimate, uh, um, I think it's here to stay. I think that that um, you know that that whether um, that that hydrogen can um, can can lead us into a clean energy future and bridge, bridge the gap, and that can be from different sources of hydrogen or different sor sources of of uh, you know sources of hydrogen from you know renewables, um, you know fossil, uh, you know water, and anything like that. But uh, but I, I think there's going to be a a uh, there is viability for different colors of hydrogen to bring us into um, uh, to, to the, the hydrogen is going to have to come from different sources and it's going to come from uh, you know what we have readily available now to produce cheap and and uh, and available hydrogen um, there are going to be technologies that are going to be able to produce um, you know we have steam reforming technologies and things that can produce hydrogen on large, large scales it's going to be difficult to bring hydrogen into those uh, hard to decarbonize sectors like um, transportation and things like that but Come later, um, but I think there are ways we can start integrating. Um, and, and once we see uh, and, and start make, making progress in developing technologies and lowering the cost of hydrogen, it can start to, um, you know, promote uh, or become more uh, widely utilized. And so I think there's there's some quite a bit of issues with the production and transport of storage to make it widely used right now. Um, but but those are initiatives certainly we're taking with the FE and carbon, uh, fossil energy and carbon management is looking at how to um, you know, develop in, in, in new technologies for production as well as storing it and, and, uh, and transporting it for, for use. Um, and so in the context of Africa, um, you know, I'm not very familiar with obviously the situation, uh, you know, for, for energy and, and, and use there, but I, I would think similarly, um, you know, it would take, um, you know, external investments um, or, or people, you know, governments and things like that to help. Uh, local governments there, uh, you know, um, in, uh, utilize and incorporate hydrogen uh, in, into energy production, and, and, um, and so uh, that, that, that's. I really don't have a good answer for the second part. I'm sorry. Mm. So. Yeah, it, well, and the jury is still, I think, very much out. The, the yeah, the, pretty much out there. The possibilities are exciting, but um, there's many yeah. a, a slip uh, twitch the cup in the lip, huh? Yeah, Perfect. I think so. Um, Ola, I was wondering, would you be willing to talk a bit about the, the specific Nigerian context? Um, I, I get the sense that you have uh, quite a bit of understanding of that area, and it, it's, it's really interesting um, 
from my perspective anyway, because on the one hand, you know, you have Shell announcing the divestiture of its onshore uh, oil uh, interests, um, uh, arguably uh, due to a, a Dutch judge in a way. Um, and on the other hand, you do have some really interesting um, initiatives being undertaken by uh, Nigerian entrepreneurs to try to put in place uh, floating LNG solutions uh, as well. Uh, how do you see the, the development there? Is it heading in the right direction? Um, are you being um, victimized as by the law of unforeseen consequences? Um, would you paint a, a rosy picture for five, 10 years from now in terms of the future of, uh, of, of developing value-added markets and, and pursuing some of these initiatives? Or, or, or how do you think it's most likely to play out? Um, yeah, thanks for that. So in terms of the, the wider context within Nigeria, and, it, and it's important, right, given that it is, you know, it holds um, the significant reserves, um, natural gas reserves. And so um, I think in terms of um, Shell's exit and where does, does that fit, there are many things, right? Um, they're exiting oil. Um, they're not, um, you know, NL, they're, they're still, NLNG is still a big play and a profitable play for them. Um, they will need to secure gas supplies for those trains. They just, um, um, you know, at the same time that they're exiting their onshore oil operations because of some of the challenges um, in that operating environment, um, increased insecurity is a major driver, um, and uh, and the impact of that insecurity on oil spills and, and, and the environment and, and how that makes operations difficult. Uh, in this context, when you're a listed entity and, and uh, trying um, to transition, um, there are certain things in terms of around cost of that insecurity of maintaining or making sure that your operations have a minimal impact on the environment that once it becomes increasingly um, a bit of a challenge for you to control, um, that you may decide um, to um, exit those operations and, and transfer um, that to people who may be better placed to manage those operations. Um, and so that's where, that's sort of the, that's where, that's the bucket in which I'll put the sort of shell announcement. And are we likely, given that this insecurity challenge is a systemic problem, not necessarily unique to shell, are we likely to see other listed entities within the context of, you know, responsible operations and, and the challenges and making sure that they are um, you know, then their limited um, impact, there's limited impact on the environment from their operations. If they don't feel like they're in a position to manage that because of increasing insecurity, are you likely to see more and more folks um, exit, especially onshore oil operations? Yes. Um, um, so I, I would say watch this space is, is the best way to look at it. What does, what impact does that have given that, you know, close to 90% of uh, for Nigeria's foreign exchange comes from um, oil and gas, and um, you know, and and just what impact does that have on its ambitions to to be, um, uh, you know, to 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 diversify its economy for get for for a gas based industrial growth or reindustrialization, so to speak. Some of those applications that we're talking about, um, this PIA, because it was twenty years in the making, it's missed a few things. It's it's sort of twenty years. It's almost fifteen years late, essentially, right? So it's a good bill tries to incentivize a lot of investments, um, especially in the gas sector, uh, which is a primary focus area going forward, because as Nigeria likes to say now, it is more a gas country than an oil country, and, and that is true. Um, but how to realize that potential um, is the biggest problem, and, ha and has it left it too late, given what's happening, right? So if a major investor like Shell exits oil operations, um, what impact does that have um, and instead of signaling and attracting more capital into that sector around some of these applications that we're talking about? Resolution of its, you know, gas is mostly consumed in the electricity sector. That electricity sector has many challenges, um, including infrastructure as well, but many financial liquidity challenges. So it does need, those issues need to be addressed with limited, with increasingly limited government resources to do so. So, Five years from now, what do I see the sector going? I think the optimist in me thinks that, um, you know, that the argument will be made and convincingly that Nigeria, um, because it has, it's, you know, it's, the, it's like Africa's largest economy. It has 200 million people. Poverty rates are high. Unemployment rates are high. There is um, 
an impetus for us to sort of while we're taking this step back on trying uh, on, on moving finance in a way um, from natural gas and, and from fossil fuels in general. I think Nigeria uh, for a wider for wider security and economic issue um, challenges that it represents if this place falls apart. That you know that my 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 hope and the optimist in me thinks that we will make the exception, and you've seen some of those exceptions. That's you know as long as investments are being made responsibly, um, i.e. the regulator takes a better job. Um, does a better job, for example, in making sure that fuel development plans ab initio have a, ga a complete gas utilization, um, uh, uh, you know, plan in included, so that you can commercialize and you have very limited flares going forward. And that's the case. And that when you are and you impose penalties on flaring and make sure that and and the DPR um, got very aggressive about doing those things, so that a more responsible. Um, um, a, 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 a regulator that's more responsible to the times and understands that we need to minimize um, the impact of gas, of, uh, the impact of, uh, of gas operations on our environment, and has the policies to not only you know to 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 make sure that they enforce those um, is key. They also need to do a better job um, of making sure that this is an an, an attractive destination for capital. Um, because you know the likes of Shell and a few other folks will continue to exit if there are better opportunities elsewhere and they can so not only attractive commercially but very minimal um, impact on the or again and, and are able to control their impact on the environment in those investment environments. So the government needs to do a better job and if the and I think that is sort of the direction the PIA that's been recently passed. Um, is you know is moving in um, you know based based on the incentives that I've looked at and it's um, and that it's trying to list NMPC and a few other things to improve the regulatory environment and bring clarity um, to the investment climate and you know attract more investments. The challenge is whether or not investors um, will you know will take a look and and and, and consider the development needs um, as well and and, and to, to to make that investment. Good. Thank you. Um, I guess that uh, are we out of time then? I guess um, it's been a, a, a great discussion, but I, I think uh, 10, uh, 1045 uh, Eastern time is, is our limit. Uh, um, Thank uh, you. This is Anthony again. Much. And I, I just wanted to give you a special thanks, Stephen, for jumping in here. Uh, Dr. Van Dyke had some bandwidth issues from what, what we understand and just could not get connected uh, from that situation. Uh, I thought the, the session went really well. I, I do have to say, since we didn't have their their original moderator on, I didn't feel like Dr. Haynes or Olu uh, were given their proper introduction. So, uh, and that's not your fault, Stephen, at all. Uh, but I, I wanted to I at least provide exactly. Yeah, you didn't even have it. So I wanted to provide it to the audience. I put it in the chat uh, for folks to be able to, to read. Uh, if you have any questions for, for anyone in this session, just let us know. We can connect you with them. Uh, but moving forward, I'd like to introduce for the next session the moderator. Uh, Mr. Michael Moore, uh, he is the program director with the United States Energy Association. He's also the managing partner of East West Strategic Advisors located in Washington, DC. Uh, he focuses on energy assets, sovereign energy security, CO2 to EOR and domestic international policy. In 2018, he co-founded the Energy Advance Center, which focuses on TCUS policy with Fred Eames of Hunt and Andrews, uh, Kurth. He was appointed by U.S. Sec Energy Secretary Perry to the National Coal Council for the 2018 uh, through 2020 term and is the Executive Director of the National Tribal Energy Association. Mike was the Executive Director of the North American Carbon Capture Storage Association in D.C. from 2008 until April 2017 and a founding member and officer in the Texas Carbon Capture Association. Over the past 30 years, Mike has been directly involved in domestic and international carbon monetization projects and related asset development, CO2 EOR efforts, low carbon projects, CO2 storage, policy and regulatory issues, and natural gas storage development, utilizing depleted oil and gas reservoirs, the commercialization of gas storage capacity, interconnection agreements, permitting land use, gas storage contracts, financing, et cetera. In addition, his, his experience includes a founding shareholder in several telecom.com electronic trading platforms, which included management, operations, money raising, and client development, 
partner in producing broker and deregulated power, data and consulting, crude oil market broker, facilitating transactions in the physical and financial markets. With all that being said, I think it's very clear. Uh, Michael's going to give us a great, a great session here as the moderator. And Michael, if you're ready, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Yeah, Brian, thank you very much. And uh, sorry about the long-winded bio. I turned 64 on August 16th, and somebody asked me about knowing a, a few things that I know. And I said, well, when you work in a space about 40 years, yet some of it sticks to you, and it can be fairly buried as well. Um, this is a, a fascinating time that we're in right now as we move forward to uh, a, a, a global event, a decarbonization and transition. Uh, and by the way, I, and I'm not going to take a lot of time here because we got two great great people here to give some wonderful insights on the things that are going on around uh, in this space. But we've seen a huge amount of funds become mobilized to support decarbonization and transition uh, globally. There's a, a huge list of projects that are being uh, uh, announced in, in the U.S. and in Europe and, and uh, Asia and elsewhere. And if I'm not mistaken, South Africa has a CO2, a CCUS CO2 pilot that will kick into gear in 2023, begin moving its first CO2. And I believe uh, Dr. Koza will be possibly bringing that up. Um, at any rate, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there and I'm going to introduce the two speakers that we have. First one will be Mark Akowicz, who's the Director Division of CCS R&D uh, at the Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management, USDOE. Uh, he is the director of the Division of Emissions Controls and Carbon Capture Utilization and Storage. Uh, research, develop R&D at the Department of DOE. He is responsible for planning, management, and administration of the division's R&D portfolio. And in this role, he leads a team of scientists and engineers that are collaborating and working domestically and internationally with industry and national laboratories, universities on developed advanced and transformational CCUS technologies. Prior to his current position, Mr. Aquix also served as DOE's Carbon Capture Program Manager and Fuels Program Manager. Before joining DOE in 2007, he worked as a consultant providing technical, analytical, and strategic planning services to the DOE and its technical research programs. Early in his career, Mark worked in the private sector in various industrial research and engineering positions where he was responsible for process development scale up activities. Uh, Mark is a 2016-2017 White House Leadership Development Fellow alumni. He has a BS in uh, Chemical Engineering from John Hopkins University and a Master's in Engineering Management from uh, GW University. Um, I also can say that I've gotten to know Mark uh, quite well over the last, what is it, I don't know, 10 years? Something like that. It's been a while uh, <laughs> in the CCUS <laughs> space and we'll we cross paths on projects and on programs and conferences. And, and of course, we have a lot of mutual friends within the industry, both at the DOE and out in commercial and, and also the, uh, the, uh, the the world of the, of the, we'll call it the political play. That, that experience at the White House for that year as a, as a fellow there had to be a very fascinating time um, with all that was going on, not uh, politics aside, just because the whole energy market was a, was a was a fire, so to speak, everything was flying. Technology and uh, discoveries and p productions changing all over, and uh, so uh, you don't have to go into it. But I just imagine it had to be quite a fascinating time to be there. And uh, Mark, with that, I'm going to turn this over to you. This is about you guys and not me. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. And yeah, great to we'll, we'll catch up sometime. Uh... And, and some of the experiences, um, but thanks everyone. And uh, um, I'm going to just spend a, a really brief uh, amount of time just talking about opportunities for CCUS in the natural gas sector. Um, you know, obviously CCUS is a technology that can be deployed uh, broadly uh, in many applications um, and, and industries, uh, but I'll focus uh, mostly on CCUS and in the natural gas sector. Um, but just kind of taking a, a, a step back and, and, a, and a high look approach, uh, CCUS is not new. The concepts have been deployed for decades. Uh, carbon capture, the technologies have been available for gas separations for, for many years. Um, you know, the question is, 
how do some of those technologies apply in certain industries? Uh, it's very well and commonly used in natural gas processing uh, to separate CO2 from, from natural gas uh, to, to help purify that natural gas product for, for markets. And in some cases, that CO2 is then utilized uh, historically. Uh, some of the main uses have been uh, enhanced oil recovery, uh, but then there's also other uses for that CO2 as well. Uh, in the U.S., uh, you know, if you factor in uh, enhanced oil recovery, there's been a 50-year history of, of CO2 use, of capturing CO2. Um, while a lot of the CO2 used in, in, in the EOR industry has uh, historically been from natural CO2 domes, uh, there are industrial sources that are used as well. Uh, we have, uh, DOE's had a 20-plus year RD, d and program. Uh, looking at everything from research for capture, uh, storage technologies, uh, all the way through field scale tests, uh, pilot scale tests, and, and uh, demonstration projects. Uh, a regulatory framework is mostly in place, uh, particularly when you're thinking about the storage side. Uh, there's EPA uh, class six rules for uh, underground injection control, so managing um, or regulate, regulating and permitting CO2 uh, injection projects for CO2 storage. Um, offshore, some of that's still e evolving, uh, but for the most part, those, the, that, that framework's in place. Uh, there's also various financial incentives, uh, both at the federal and state level. And then when you're thinking about companies having, uh, you know, the direction that they're moving in terms of, of having net zero, uh, uh, goals uh, set for their for their companies. They offer potentially procurement opportunities as as well to help decarbonize. So CCUS can play a role in those efforts. Globally, there's many projects that that have occurred. I'm just highlighting three because they're focused on uh, the natural gas uh, type sector. There's most people are obviously aware of of Sleipner in in Norway that's had a 20 plus year history, but there's also been the Lula project in Brazil. Uh, and then also the Shell Quest project uh, up in Canada, which has been separating CO2 from their natural gas uh, uh, processing uh, facilities or their, their natural gas to, to hydrogen and, and uh, uh, steam generating facilities for, for some of the oil sands projects up in, up in Canada. Uh, but again, CCUS is applicability throughout the full value chain of, of the natural gas uh, uh, system, whether it's removing CO2 from from natural gas itself uh, all the way down to managing CO2 emissions from uh, combustion of, of natural gas or converting it into, into other products. Uh, in the U.S., uh, we've had a, a, a demonstration program and three projects. Uh, there's, uh, again, showing the breadth and diversity of CCUS applications. Uh, one project was on an ethanol facility looking at saline storage. Uh, one on a coal-fired power plant with enhanced soil recovery. But then I, I want to highlight the, the top one, the Air Products Facility in Port Arthur, Texas, which is capturing CO2 from steam methane reforming uh, that's producing hydrogen. So, again, just kind of showing the diversity and, and flexibility of the technology, but then also its, it's uh, uh, application in the natural gas sector uh, as, as well, and that these technologies are moving forward and that they, they are advancing uh, beyond the, the lab scale. Uh, looking at, at, at on, on the power generation side, and this is something where we have uh, our carbon capture program has feed studies front end engineering design, um, and then coupling that with storage activities that we have through something called Carbon Safe, Carbon Safe which stands for Carbon Storage Assurance Facility Enterprise which is looking at large-scale uh, CO2 storage and saline formations. Uh, when we're saying large-scale, we're looking at 50-plus million metric tons of CO2 uh, total. Many of these sites uh, are in the hundreds, uh, potentially hundreds of millions of tons uh, uh, storage capacity. So I'm going to focus on the natural gas uh, op opportunities, and there's four uh, located in blue. Uh, one of those is associated with the Carbon Safe Project, which is the triangle, but then the circle shows the feed studies associated with uh, uh, the Carbon Safe Projects. The one thing that I do want to point out on this uh, slide is 
that it's looking at that there are a whole host of different technologies that are being being uh, considered. Um, some of them are your first generate, what we would call first generation type technologies, but there's also second generation technologies that have come through the through the R and D program. For example, Ion Clean Energy Systems, um, which is a, a novel uh, solvent uh, using ionic liquids uh, in, in coupling with amines, a uh, membrane technology. Uh, Southern Company has been looking at the Lindy uh, BASF uh, solvent uh, as well. So, uh, which is which was a technology that came through our R&D portfolio. So we're starting again to see some of these advanced technologies uh, move through the move through the portfolio. Uh, again, looking at the industrial sector, we've been focusing on some pre-feasibility studies, uh, looking at again hydrogen, uh, steel, uh, and additional ethanol facilities, and I'll come back to that one in a minute, and then cement plants. Uh, for the for the ethanol facility, uh, contrary to, or, or uh, how this project is different than the ADM project, where ADM looked at CO2 from processing facilities, this is looking at CO2 uh, not just from the process facilities, but also the heat and power generation. So that can be both coal and natural gas um, that's generation. So again, showing how how technologies uh, and and how natural gas is used in a variety of industries and how to decarbonize that natural gas um, using CCS in these in these industries uh, so just kind of touching on technology uh, you know I mentioned some of our advanced technologies have been have are, are starting to move out into the commercial environment uh, we have a number of capabilities that we've invested in such as the National Carbon Capture Center uh, which is a facility in, in Alabama in the United States uh, focused on testing CO2 capture technologies, uh, a whole variety of, of, of options, uh, advanced solvents, sorbents, membranes. Uh, but the, the approach that we take at DOE is kind of taking a very holistic approach, looking at the process chemistry, the materials, uh, the equipment design, uh, and how these technologies integrate into various applications. And again, uh, testing on, on a variety of, of sources such as coal-fired gas, but also natural gas-fired uh, as, as well. And we're increasing the capabilities of the facility to look at carbon removal technologies such as direct air capture. Uh, again, just looking at our carbon storage program, I've, I've done a, a broad uh, amount of work in this space. And, and again, when you're thinking of carbon storage, applicable to uh, essentially any source of, of CO2 uh, that, that's available, it, the question then becomes, how close are these sources of CO2 to those sinks? And that's a lot of the work that we did initially with our regional carbon sequestration partnerships in the United States is, is doing some of that initial source sink matching. And now we move that and transition that into a regional deployment initiative where we're looking at how can we now start moving towards deployment and really pushing CCUS forward uh, as, as an option to, to decarbonize. Uh, again, I touched upon carbon safe, but we're also looking at offshore storage and looking at ways that we can um, uh, utilize some novel uh, field uh, techniques such as brine extraction, uh, removing brine from from the subsurface, treating that brine, uh, turning it into a, a usable uh, water source, but then also the benefits that that has in terms of the storage uh, operations, whether that's a pore space, being able to uh, manage the pressure front and plume front for, for CO2, and then coupling all of this field work uh, into our R&D program to develop better modeling simulation tools and monitoring tools and capabilities uh, to really help optimize carbon storage operations. And again, uh, making all this information uh, available to the public, uh, we have a significant amount of, of our data and, and, and work uh, posted online. Uh, just some of the things we've had a series of best practice manuals that have been uh, developed over 10 years, uh, showing all the work uh, that, that's come through our, our various projects our carbon storage atlas, which assesses the um, 
carbon storage uh, capabilities or the, the amount of, of storage capacity that's available uh, throughout the United States. But then just a lot of general tools and capabilities developed through the national labs, including NETL. Uh, and again, you know, cooperation uh, is critical to advancing CCUS globally. There's a number of ways to, to engage globally. Um, and whether that's if you have questions on projects or looking at ways to collaborate, coordinate, whether it's on R&D, commercial projects, trying to understand the, the technical and policy side. Uh, there's IEA and the various uh, technology collaboration programs like IEA GHG. Uh, the Clean Energy Ministerial and Mission Innovation, uh, the Carbon Sequestration Leadership Forum, uh, Accelerating CCS Technologies Initiative, which is looking at joint R&D, and then also the Global CCS Institute as well. Uh, so definitely a lot of different mechanisms and ways to, to collaborate and, and seek opportunities uh, on a multilateral scale, but obviously, you know, we're always interested in doing things bilaterally as well. And with that, uh, here's some uh, sources for more information, and uh, uh, we'll take questions, uh, you know, after after Dr. Coase's. So uh, again, thanks, thanks, and look forward to uh, the discussion. Mark, and and thank you very much. There is quite a bit there, and you could probably talk for a whole day. The areas that, that the DOE has uh, resources and uh, uh, opportunities to explore this further. So uh, thank you. I'm going to move over to uh, Dr. David Koza and uh, I'm going to read. Uh, well, he's quite accomplished for those that on our side of the world who do not know Dr. Koza. You, you get to, you need to know him. He's the executive manager of the Integrated Geoscience Development Council of Geoscience for the Republic of South Africa. Uh, David is a Dr. Koza is a geophysicist who has worked in minerals exploration, mining, and geoscience research. After completing BSc Honors Degree in Geophysics. Uh, Dr. Koza joined BHP Billiton's Mineral Exploration Division, conducting geophysical surveys primarily in Africa. Uh, they took a break and then back into academia to complete a PhD, which focused on understanding the tectonic evolution of the Southern African lithosphere using magnetotelluric magneto data. Sorry about that. Following that, he joined Anglo-American's Technical Solutions Department and supporting several business units in mining, green and brownfield exploration and research efforts within Anglo-American. He then joined Spectrum Air, uh, primarily focused on airborne electromagnetic data processing, modeling, interpretation and research. He holds a BSc in uh, Geology and Physics, uh, BSc Honors in Geophysics and PhD in Geophysics from the University of which Waters Rand specializing in EM methods. Uh, Dr. Coase is currently an executive manager, integrated geoscience development at the Council for, Geo for Geoscience, leading the national geoscience mapping program in South Africa. And if I'm not mistaken, you're also the head of the CCS pilot project that's underway in South Africa as well. Yeah. Well, thanks, thanks, Mark. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay, awesome. Um, so I, I won't take I won't take too long, uh, but I just wanted to share with you some uh, perspective on the work we're currently doing um, in, in in South Africa, um, and um, I think it's probably best to start with a little bit of context of where we are uh, in South Africa. We uh, we generate a lot of uh, electricity uh, using uh, coal, and we have a number of uh, coal-fired power stations um, across. Uh, 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 the country, and uh, some of these coal-fired uh, power stations are planned for decommissioning in the next five to ten years. And this is because, um, you know, we're moving uh, towards um, a low-carbon economy, amongst other things. The problem is that we still have a lot of coal, uh, and the, the, the latest policy in South Africa um, has recognized that coal will still be part of our economy, of our energy mix, uh, for a very long time. Um, but we have an interesting problem. Um, when some of these coal-fired power stations are decommissioned, we're probably going to end up with, you know, some six, seven thousand uh, people uh, being being unemployed. And in terms of the CO2 emissions, um, you know, we've signed up uh, to a number of international agreements uh, that are planning to reduce 
um, uh, CO2 emissions by some 50% in the next 10 years. Now, um, in the latest policy, um, the, the government has adopted this just transition approach uh, towards a low carbon economy. So we need to find innovative solutions uh, to address uh, some of these issues. And CCUS in particular uh, is, 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 is one of those solutions. So um, in South Africa, we're hoping that in the next two years, we'll have a working uh, pilot plant actually sitting in, at the site right now, uh, where uh, we'll inject some um, you know, 50,000 uh, tons of CO2 underground at about one kilometer depth. So the, the site that we've chosen is close to a Sasol Secunda plant. For those who know um, Sasol, um, we have a huge petrochemical plant here that produces about 56 million tons of CO2. The site itself is about 20 kilometers away from Secunda. Uh, the site is, is, is there uh, and Secunda is sitting there somewhere. Now, um, in terms of the geological storage itself, we're looking at you know, having um, an extensive storage um, up to about a kilometer depth uh, in what are called prophetic lavas, uh, for those who are, who are geologists know what those are. But um, much more than that, we're looking at uh, utilization. And this is where I think a lot of the collaboration uh, needs to come through. And, and this is where we're seeking active collaboration. And we're looking at a number of CO2 um, as part of the sequestration process uh, for the construction materials, looking at polymers, generation of new materials, uh, especially uh, fertilizer. Uh, for those who know South Africa, it's been a, a mining uh, country for a very long time, and we have had problems, significant problems when it comes to acid mine drainage. So what we're hoping to do uh, through sequestration of CO2 uh, is essentially killing a number of uh, birds with one stone uh, where we're treating mine water uh, while sequestering CO2 and producing high quality water for various uses and then reducing the volumes of the mineral waste uh, residues. And these are some of the technologies that we're looking at uh, that uh, we, we will hopefully get some collaborative partners going. One of the biggest exercises we're doing is the production of fertilizer um, and, and given some of the food security issues that we have within South Africa and the continent, um, hopefully through uh, utilization, uh, we'll look at, at a number of those options. So I think um, not to waste too much time, but I think in terms of the collaboration opportunities, there's a number of things we're looking at, and I'm hoping that uh, perhaps through this platform, uh, we, can, we can develop some of those, some of those options. Let me leave it at there uh, now for, uh, for now, Mike, thanks. Dr. Koza, thank you very much. We are running just a couple of minutes back, but we are available for uh, a couple of questions. Mark, if you want to be available and see if we've got some that are here to come to us. And Brian, if you're online, I, I'm going to ask you if we have had any preset questions that might have come in. And I'm, I'm looking on, on, on chat to see if we've got messages coming in from there. At this juncture, I don't see any, but I've got, I've got a, 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 an observation. We have um, in the United States um, the Navajo, the Hopi, and the uh, Crow, who have uh, massive amounts of uh, coal as a resource that's still in the ground. It's not. It, it's not, some of it's been mined over the years, and it, it's a little bit opposite. They don't have as much of the infrastructure that you have in South Africa with the with the coal, the liquids, and in the coal to power pro programs that you've got, but for them, employment of their of their people is a big issue, and monetization of the resources is a big issue. And of course, uh, you know, coal is not exactly something that people in the U.S. now are kind of reaching aggressively to engage. It's a it's a tough it's a tough political subject in a number of different areas. But but they they have they have the components that that you also have. I'm not so sure that there might be some lessons learned on your side that are helpful to, to this side, and, and and we can offline, we can we can follow up on that, uh, work close with them. And uh, with that, uh, Mark, is there anything you might want to toss in there on some of the technology pieces that 
uh, Dr. Koza had outlined there with uh, utilization uh, and the value of that. I mean, yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, so that's definitely, uh, I, I didn't touch upon it uh, in a lot of detail in, 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 our, in my presentation, but we do have a, um, a utilization program uh, through, my, through, through our office where we're looking at different, and, and this is non-EOR utilization, so things like mineralization, uh, converting CO2 to polymers or, or fuels um, and chemicals. So uh, a lot of that work is, is still early stage R&D, uh, lab and bench scale, but, but things like the, the mineralization concepts actually have, uh, are a little bit more advanced and, and are, are moving towards pilot scale and, and uh, more, more commercial uh, oriented operations. So um, there's definitely, I think, some opportunities to continue collaborations uh, and, and discussions offline in terms of you know, how we might be able to leverage some of the the learnings uh, on both sides and, and how we might be able to to uh, address some common issues and, and challenges. The, the piece about um, using CO2 to clean up mine wastewater uh, is, is, would have certainly some applications in certain parts of the U.S. where there's been hard rock mining in a, no, a number of different areas with different products where we have mine waste issues. It's not just relegated to say uh, earlier coal mining, but other hard rock mining as well. That that that's something that uh, would be, I think, very interesting for here. I don't know how much work that we're doing at the DOE in that same area. I'm sure that there's some of that. Yeah, we're 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 just starting to, uh, you know, uh, historically we had uh, probably about 10 or 12 years ago at DOE we had done some initial work and it was actually through NETL um, and, and and some of the other labs had had done some initial work on uh, looking at mineralization concepts of and, and ex situ mineralization as 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 you noted, Dr. Koza um, and because there's there's a lot of this this uh, mine mine waste uh, that is has an affinity for for uh, CO2 reactions. Um, so thinking of that in terms of carbon dioxide removal and and options to uh, uh, capture that CO2 and 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 remove it and then potentially even convert it into products uh, are are some opportunities as well. So. Um, yeah, I think that's definitely another potential uh, area and opportunity where, where we can have some further discussions. Uh, Dr. Koza, since we had such a tight time, is there any other areas of interest or work you'd like to throw out on the table to uh, for us and the attendees to think about? Yeah, so one of the one of the key things we're looking at is actually enhanced uh, geothermal energy um, as part of the sequestration. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, fortunately, we have uh, some hot rocks that we think we can exploit as part of the sequestration uh, process. And I think uh, the U.S. in particular would be a very good candidate uh, for that for sort of work. Um, so that's, that's, that's one of the, the technologies uh, we're looking at. Yeah. I think you're muted, Mike. Muted, but uh, I was going to ask Brian is with we're right up bouncing right up towards the uh, 1120 number on the calendar or the agenda. Do you want us to all hang tight and be part of the the, the closing remarks and Q and A, or do we want to retire off the uh, program at this point? I, I think uh, that's a question for Anthony, and he should. Jump in here just momentarily. Sure. And on time. Thank you so much, Mike and uh, Mark and, and Dr. Koza. We really appreciate your input today. This is great. I'm going to say at this point, our session is is done, Mark and and Dr. Koza, and I'm going to step off the. Video.
Okay, Jim, if you're ready. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Dr. Koza. All right. Can uh, everybody hear okay? Yep. Yes, sir. All righty. Uh, good morning. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Jim Jewell. I'm the Acting Deputy Director for African and Middle Eastern Affairs at the Department of Energy. Um, I'm also the lead on the Power Africa project that provided the funding for us to stage this event. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to join all of you today. Um, I'd like to first thank Anthony and the team from Nettle for such great work organizing the event. John, Baba, and the team. Thanks for all of your efforts pulling this all together, and thanks to all the speakers for participating. I'd also like to thank, thank Gina from uh, my team, who's, who worked hard to ensure this workshop remained on track, and the F Fossil Energy Carbon Management team, especially Natina Dobson, for continuing partnership on this effort and related efforts. Uh, this, uh, this event went through an interesting journey from its original focus on developing gas projects and gas to power infrastructure. Um, the workshop was originally planned for early 2020 before COVID-19 got in the way of our uh, original plan and, and we had to adjust. Um, over the past several months, we pivoted the meeting to focus on thinking more clearly about the need to balance plans to use natural gas with ensuring efforts to mitigate emissions and invest in cleaner technology. Uh, I think this event developed in a very interesting and full discussion of the challenges and opportunities we all face, and I hope we can continue this discussion in the future and find more ways to work together to determine how natural gas might fit into an increasingly decarbonized clean energy feature. We started planning this workshop as part of our uh, Power Africa Understanding Natural Gas and LNG program, the program which began in 2015. The Power Africa handbook, its effort is also evolving. Uh, we have a new handbook that is in development and we have had to rethink the program and the end product along similar lines as this workshop over the last several months. So uh, stay tuned for events later in the year that hopefully will launch a handbook that will help outline the role of natural gas development paired with cleaner energy and the greatest possible abatement of emissions. I think this workshop helped us as we work to reframe the new handbook. Um, I hope that it likewise was helpful to the attendees and speakers as we all refine our thinking on these issues and work hard to ensure a cleaner energy future, prosperity, energy access and good clean energy se sector jobs. Uh, in summary from the workshop, uh, let me review some of the key topics uh, outlined by Landon yesterday in slightly different words uh, when he opened the workshop, which have been themes throughout the discussion. Uh, during this webinar, we discussed the merits of deploying natural gas, but we're also upfront about addressing challenges natural gas emissions will pose to the health of our world and the urgent need to develop new technology and partner to invest in modern infrastructure. There is a role for natural gas to play, particularly when paired with renewable energy and existing ever improving and emerging technology to evade emissions, but we need to be more discerning in our analysis of when and where natural gas is used in the future. If we are to achieve net zero emissions by 2050, we must be especially thoughtful about new natural gas infrastructure, ensuring we account for the risk of new greenfield natural gas infrastructure ending up as stranded assets while prioritizing the importance of energy access, jobs, and broader economic growth. African countries are rightly interested in harnessing their local resources as the continent begins to transform from fuels with higher greenhouse gas emissions, coal and oil in particular, but also biomass, all while meeting the incredible demand for energy that one would expect from strong population growth and anticipated economic growth in the continent. We discuss how Africa has significant natural gas resources, making natural gas development attractive, often low cost short term option for some countries. In this regard, we must continue to focus on the challenge associated with harnessing flared gas and preventing fugitive emissions that fuel climate change. 
This webinar was an opportunity for us to get together and explore ideas and solutions for us to collaborate to ensure natural gas in Africa is harnessed for local use while minimizing the release of methane into the atmosphere and ensuring that our other emissions such as CO2 are increasingly captured and used or stored safely. Over the course of the event and into the future, we'll explore working together to develop technological solutions so that natural gas can be economically and sustainably used in Africa. We also explored how natural gas can work in concert with renewable energy. Natural gas development can serve as a catalyst for an enhanced renewable energy capacity, building capacity that fortifies hybrid grids as the best technologies emerge commercially and costs plummet over the next few years. We must work together to plan for infrastructure that is flexible enough to incorporate renewable energy, battery storage, hydrogen, and smart electricity grids, as well as ensuring redundancy to enhance a reliable base, base load generation. It will be important for all of us to work together to plan, design, and assist in the implementation of integrated affordable clean energy systems in Africa. With integrated systems, the move toward cleaner energy can be facilitated by using natural gas developed cleanly and with ever lower emissions to ensure the flexible power infrastructure needed to reach net zero emissions and ensure an affordable transition to decarbonization and the power sector of the future. We heard that countries at different stages have different needs, particular challenges and different local circumstances that must be considered but we all face the common challenges arising from climate change that we must work together to address. We also discussed the need for African nations transitioning to clean energy to ensure an enabling environment that promotes investment and enduring commercial partnerships with financial partners, both public and private. Our panelists noted that some gas development with maximum affordable abatement and paired with renewables is critical to developing modern resilient energy systems in Africa. The connection between energy and climate is an opportunity, an opportunity to use energy innovation to increase economic growth while decreasing greenhouse gas emissions. Ensuring just transitions for disadvantaged workers and populations will not be easy, but assisting communities to Prosper in, clean, in the clean energy economy will be essential to ensuring a successful energy transition. Clean energy projects present business job and job opportunities in Africa that can stimulate local supply chain development, training, and high quality jobs, as well as the opportunity to pass on the generation, pass on to the generations that follow some of the tools that will be needed to build a green energy ecosystems for the future. The world is moving toward clean energy and we need Africa to be part of that transition and to benefit from it. And we want to work with Africa to make it happen. We want to work with you to fuel innovation, drive growth, create good jobs and stimulate country to country, business to business and people to people, cooperation and ties. The transition will not be accomplished solely by governments. It must be undertaken collaboratively with gov by governments, universities, research institutes, non-governmental organizations, multilateral donor institutions, and the private sector. We all need to work together. The challenges and opportunities that Africa faces as it seeks to transition towards a net zero future are many. As we all know, it is difficult for Africa to balance transition needs and development needs, but finding this balance will be necessary as countries build back better in their recovery from COVID-19. African countries have energy and natural and human resources and are eager to partner with other nations on this transition. And we are likewise eager to partnership with them, partner with them, excuse me. I would say to you that our discussions over the past few days has enriched us all and set the tone for, for further discussion and new collaborative relationships. U.S. Department of Energy is interested in partnering with African nations and entities to work through the challenges and opportunities for utilizing natural gas in the cleanest and most responsible manner possible, while helping facilitate transition to a net zero energy future. Please stay in touch and we will also be reaching out through a variety of channels to build new coalitions and partnerships as we move forward. I hope that the materials that will be shared and posted after the event will be, continue to prove useful to all. 
including colleagues that were not able to attend the past two days of discussions and that we can continue this conversation and promote the ideas we are developing to ensure concrete action. Finally, I hope everyone has a good evening and I hope we will all be in touch again soon. Over to you, Anthony, for any final uh, thoughts and information. Yep, thanks, G thanks, Jim, and thanks again to everybody uh, who, who participated in this and helped set it up. Uh, I do want to direct you over to the chat where I posted a link uh, to our web page for this effort. Uh, on that link, you'll find, uh, give us a couple days, we'll have all the slides posted to there in PDF form, uh, as well as the recording of the two days uh, sessions. Uh, lastly, if you have any follow-up interest in, in discussions, collaborative ideas, et cetera, please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us, but particularly myself, and I can help direct you to who it is you're looking for uh, if it's not me. So finally, I just, I just thank you one more time for participating and uh, look forward to, to working with you all in the future. So thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening.